Well, thank you all. I, I apologise again for the late start. Traffic is basically our, our, well, we're dealing with bigger things tonight, but the immediate thing was traffic. Um, so let me start by acknowledging uh, the country that we're on. We're on the land of the uh, Wurundjeri people here, the Kulin Nation. Uh, this is, of course, a country that's never been um, ceded. And uh, we respect um, their elders, past, the present, but also future. And uh, we'll have a, a short um, video that says something about, about this. Uh, I'll just play very quickly if it comes up. Deakin University would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the unceded lands, skies and waterways on which our students and staff come together as we learn, teach, innovate and research through virtually and physically constructed places across time we pay our deep respect to the elders and ancestors who have cared for the country that you join us from an ancient place where education, innovation and knowledge transfer have taken place for many thousands of years at Deakin we aim to nurture and continue this important legacy whilst encouraging our communities to walk softly on country in the spirit of sustainability. In particular, we give gratitude to the elders and ancestors of Wadawurrung country, Wurundjeri country and Eastern Ma country and beyond where our physical campuses are located. Their contributions to our learning communities and environments are rich and highly valued. Deakin is committed to embedding indigenous knowledges and perspectives in all disciplines that we teach, as well as advancing the self-determined interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, including treaty and truth-telling. As you move around our physical and virtual environments, take a moment to consider, appreciate and listen deeply to the country beneath your feet. I won't introduce our speakers in, in detail, their bios are here and you're probably familiar, but uh, just to thank uh, Tito, uh, Pradeep, um, Emma and Robert. This is an almost perfect panel. I say almost because the ratio of blokes with beards is a little bit too high. Uh, we haven't got our gender balance um, close to where it should be, but I'm very uh, grateful for all panellists. And um, uh, rather than introduce them, I'll, I'll, I'll um, uh, let them... Um, make a brief opening statement about particular things that they're working on and thinking about, but they all have a global interest and we're going to link this conversation back in that global in interest, uh, building on their specialist interests, which are broader than you might think at first. Um, so I don't know, um, perhaps uh, Emma, if you don't mind leading us off, yep. if that's yep. fine. Yep. yep. Um, can you hear me if I stay here or do I need to? Uh, perhaps come up here because we're recording it. So there's a, there's, I, I'd like to think a thousand people online <laughs> sure joining us. There might not be exactly a thousand, but there are people online and we are recording this. So even though the group here is not as large as it deserves, um, the recording is really useful. And we'll be sure. Happy. No, no problem. Actually, just the Zoom. Okay. Oh, okay. So so we'll Thanks. <laughs> thank you. That's why I was here. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I will be very brief, just so that we can move to a discussion. Um, so my focus is on um, American politics and particularly on the Australia-US alliance. Um, so there's a lot I could say, but I thought I would talk, <laughs> well, I actually thought I would talk about yesterday um, because I don't know about you, but I'm still feeling a little bit triggered by the whole experience um, and the flashbacks to, to Trump um, 1.0. I won't kind of talk through what happened because I'm sure you're all kind of sick of hearing it, um, but I do want to talk about how it was framed in the Australian media and how, for our purposes, democracy and our so-called shared value with the United States of democracy was completely absent from any of the conversations about that incident, despite the fact that the whole thing was kicked off by Rudd's comments about Trump's threat to American democracy. So the Australian media kind of lost its collective mind yesterday, um, briefly, after this incident, and there was a whole lot of 
um, you know, immediate think pieces, kind of nodding sagely about the risks that had come with appointing Kevin Rudd and that we'd all known this. One article in the nine papers said that he Rudd was a bomb waiting to go off um, and that Canberra was now faced with the alarming prospect that Rudd will have to deal with a leader of the free world that hates his guts. Um, the Australian Financial Review went even further, arguing that during the first Trump administration, the coalition had known that, and this is a quote, cozying up to a madman is a necessity. It's called taking one for the team. So that was his advice to Kevin Rudd. So that's the kind of framing that we're dealing with. There's no mention of democracy or our kind of shared values as open liberal democracies anywhere. Cozying up to a madman, in the case of the United States, is necessary. There's no talk in any of that about the active threat that Donald Trump poses to those values and to American democracy and the impact that that might have on Australia. It was all about whether a man who has said there'll be a bloodbath if he's not elected, has said he wishes his people sat up at attention like Kim Jong-un's do, has said Vladimir Putin can do whatever the hell he wants. There was no talk about that and what that might mean, about what cozying up to a person like that might mean for Australia and for our shared values with the United States. Um, so I might leave it there <laughs> to kind of throw that out there um, around basically my, my argument that we have an awful lot of work to do in Australia to understand the implications of a Trump presidency, a second Trump presidency or, or even a um, close election result in, in the United States and what that might mean for us. But I'll leave it there. Well, yeah, you know, and that's, that's America. At least we've got <laughs> India and Indonesia and Russia. So <laughs> Should we agree not? Right? <laughs> <laughs> you go to yeah. Indonesia first, but they've already had elections. Right? That's right. Yes, we not, <laughs> well, we, we're waiting for the result of the elections. We know what the uh, the count is of who the next president will be. You know, we're sitting about that. We don't know what the politics will be yet. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the the the, um, the election result was uh, announced yesterday, and most likely, Prabhu is going to be uh, my next president. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot to be. If you're from, you know, I'm I'm an anthropologist, I'm, and I'm a journalist, and uh, I was very close to a lot of the activists in the in the '98 movement, uh, you know, toppling Suharto. Um, so there's a lot to be sad or angry about the fact that now we have Prabowo, who is a human rights abuser, um, is you know former military general, uh, has done some bad things. Um, so there's a lot to be disappointed about, and I, I don't know which stage of grieving I'm in right now. You know, but I think it's weirdly I'm weirdly optimistic as well. And I think partly I was talking with Emma and Pradeep about this about there's a choice now to be optimistic or pessimistic, and there's a lot to be pessimistic about. But I think. I remain optimistic because during, uh, you know, I'm on WhatsApp groups with a lot of these old activists um, from Indonesia, um, but I'm also, my research is on social media in Indonesia, so I watch a lot of the, the reactions from people on social media. And <laughs> I read an Instagram um, comment on Prabowo's account that basically calls Prabowo a, a fat ass, basically saying, hey, fat ass, you won the election, where's my free lunch? <laughs> and and that comment, I think, says, yeah, Prabowo cannot be so hard. So Prabowo is now facing young people, many, many young people who voted for him, but who also have felt democracy for the last, you know, 12, 13 years. It's an imperfect democracy, but I think, but I th you know, so the young people are not going to just stay quiet if Prabowo does something that destroys the democracy that they've been enjoying. Um, but also at the same time, you know, looking at my WhatsApp groups with all these old activists and they mobilize straight away and they're like, you know, saying all this stuff. But, you know, we've always been in a minority. Left progressive politics have always been in a minority, but we know how to be a minority. We know how to oppose, um, you know, we, you know, we have experience. So I think, uh, yeah, now I think if I have to summarize it, I think I choose to be optimistic. But I think the victory of Prabowo has shown a lot of, um, gaps and also the, and it's not just about Prabowo, I think it's about Jokowi as well, and how Jokowi has basically, I don't know, I'm trying not to be too dramatic about this, but I think he has kind of destroyed uh, a lot of.
the you know good parts about democracy in Indonesia. Um, I think even this is the, the fact that all the presidential candidates, all the vice presidential candidates were men, um, despite the fact that we are seeing a lot of really amazing women uh, leaders in Indonesia um, in, in the last you know, 10 years or so. Um, that's just one small element here where I think we need to support this leaders who are, who have been leading from the borders, from the margins. And I am including as well, you know, like um, diverse leaders. And, and now I think we're kind of going back to that Japanese kind of core. Um, and that's, yeah, that's always been the dominant power. And I think we see that in the last election. So that's, that's I think, my kind of summary of where we are now. I should have mentioned too that Tito's sort of um, <clears throat> side hobby expertise is Indonesian horror movies. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is interesting because um, horror movies have been so popular in Indonesia. And I think you can learn a lot just from watching horror movies and also horror stories yeah. um, that people share with each other. Are you an ACDC fan, Tito? Yes. The horror movie right there in my team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what it's like watching the elections, right? Oh. I know. Yeah, it's a little bit like that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, India obviously uh, is uh, going to hold the mother of all elections, and I think the Election Commission of India uh, really, if, if anyone should get any credit for Indian democracy, is the Election Commission of India. The fact that they are able to hold this election and just, just one number, there's plenty of numbers, just one number, which is mind-boggling, there's 1.2 million polling stations, 960 million voters uh, in this forthcoming election. So just the scale of the elections is mind-boggling. Uh, in terms of uh, the substance of politics uh, of Indian elections, uh, judging by um, all the reports and talking to people. I've been to India four times in the last uh, five months. And just the conversation I've had with people, uh, both the supporters and, and the critics of the Modi government, uh, everybody seems to think that uh, there's no way Modi or the BJP are going to lose this election. So this looks like a very one-sided contest. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Modi himself has been talking about, you know, not about you know, expressing any doubts about winning the election, but he's been talking about how many more seats they're going to get. And he's talked about 370 seats. Um, India's lower house has 543 seats. And they're talking about 370 seats for the BJP. And because it's a coalition, uh, although BJP doesn't need other coalition partners, but they maintain the coalition, and 400 with, with, the, with the coalition, with the other parties in the coalition. Now, we don't know. We'll have to wait and see till the 4th of June when the votes are counted. Um, so, but at this stage, opposition seems to be in a very weak position. Congress party, which has ruled India for much of India's independent sort of history, uh, seems to be not really uh, doing as well as a national party. Uh, it has become one of many parties, and most of the parties in India are regional parties. Right? So they are, their influence is largely confined to one state or maybe maximum two states, but they're mostly regional parties. And Congress party, once, you know, the Grand Old Party of India, is today having to do deals with with regional parties. And they did strike up an alliance last year. So when uh, the Congress was in power between 2004 and 2014, uh, they were the leader of a coalition called the United Progressive Alliance or the UPA coalition. And the UPA had kind of existed until last year, but now UPA is gone. That coalition which was in power for so long is now gone. And now there is a new coalition, which they have coined um, a name for this so that the acronym is India, I-N-D-I-A, the India Coalition. But already one of the founders of this coalition has defected. <laughs> uh, so the chief minister of Bihar, uh, who is notorious 
or changing, changing sites all the time. But um, the chief minister of Bihar, who was a key player at one stage, uh, there was even talk of him being the prime ministerial candidate of this coalition. Because one of the one of the things that the, the ruling party, the BJP, demands of opposition parties, they say, if not Modi, then who? In other words, who is going to be your prime minister? If, if this alliance somehow wins the election, who will be the prime minister? <clears throat> so can you compare Modi with who? Ra Rahul Gandhi? And, and they have they have had a deliberate strategy for going back more than 10 years of um, mocking Rahul Gandhi. So Rahul Gandhi, of course, is the sign of the Nehru Gandhi family, and he's been campaigning very hard in these elections. Uh, he's he walked uh, the length of India, you know, when he walked from uh, Kanyakumari to Kashmir. Now he's on another such uh, walk called the Nyayatra, or the Justice Journey, uh, and so he he's he's I think trying to build up or to regain some of the lost ground that Congress has lost uh, over the last 10 years, but he's finding it difficult. And that sort of constant mocking of Rahul Gandhi makes it that much harder. And, and even young kids, you know, talk about Rahul Gandhi as if he's a, he's a kid, you know, and BJP calls him Papu. Papu is usually a very common name for young boys in India, a nickname. And they call him Papu, uh, which is a way of mocking him. And on social media, you will find you know, so many different ways in which the leader of the Congress Party, the main opposition party, is mocked. So I'm not, I'm not very optimistic that uh, we're going to have a fair contest here. Fair in the sense that uh, BJP, in terms of uh, their organizational machinery, and since the BJP has been in power uh, since 2014, they have they have built up a formidable machine. BJP membership is now the size. In fact, they say they have more members than the Communist Party of China. So they have more than 94 million members. They have also followed a system where they have built permanent offices, party offices, in every district building. You know, their own buildings and like the Chinese Communist Party has. Uh, so, uh, but, but I'm not saying that the Chinese, there's a real parallel between the Communist Party of China and the Chinese Communist Party because the size is the only real parallel. But they, they certainly have a much more uh, efficient machinery for holding elections. For example, just to give you one example and then I'll stop. Um, BJP has, a, you know, the electoral roll, the printed electoral roll. I don't, I'm not even sure if they print them anymore, but they used to be in the old days, there used to be a printed electoral roll for each constituency. A BJP has a person in charge of each page of the electoral roll. So with 960 million voters, each page, if a page has, I don't know how many names, 100 names, uh, they have somebody who is responsible for that page and of actually contacting those people directly. So the machinery, the money recently, some of you may have heard about the, the election, how the elections are funded in India. When BJP came to power, they introduced a new system called electoral bond system. Uh, it's a complicated system, but just to briefly uh, sum it up, uh, electoral bond, anybody can buy an electoral bond from the State Bank of India. You can go to the bank and buy an electoral bond. Electoral bonds have a unique identification number. So the, the, the individual or the company buying the bond can be identified. It's actually the individual's usual. And then they can give the bond to anyone, any party, any political party. And these, these donations are supposed to be anonymous. But some people challenged it in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has recently handed down a decision, and they have asked the state bank to release that data to the Election Commission of India and to make it public. And the bulk of the funding has gone to the BJP. So it's now become clear, and the, the donors who are the key donors, that's also now public. So 
Number one, a very efficient, very well organized election machinery, very well funded election machinery. Uh, BJP has published the list of its candidates, uh, not all, but many of the candidates have already been published. So I don't see any real competitor, not Congress, not, um, not this coalition. Thank you, Pradeep. And of course, India's election festival will start next month and run through to June. Um, unlike Indonesia, which on February 14th, but it all done in one day, including like the president in one round, we'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, but because Russia's had its election, there's been a chance for um, Prime Minister Modi to send his congratulations to uh, somebody right. who is not one of the world's leading dicta- uh, de- de- Democrats. Uh, <laughs> so Rob will unpack that because what is happening, what happened with Russia's election, what's happening is not just a Russian affair, it, it has global implications, including the things that keep uh, Imran awake at night. It's interesting, just, just quickly, when uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan was recently sworn in, um, uh, Prime Minister Modi sent congratulations to him. There was a 13 line, 13 word statement, and he congratulated him not for his election, for being sworn in as Prime Minister of Pakistan. But in the case of Putin, the message clearly says, I congratulate you on your election as um, as the president. I think Russia. it was genuine admirer. It's, 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 it's sound sentiment there. Anyway, so. <laughs> Robert. Okay, thanks. So, um, I suppose here, as a Russia specialist, I'm addressing a rather a different problem to my colleagues who are talking about the challenges of democracy and potential democratic deconsolidation a crisis of, uh, of democratic institutions and practices in the, the societies they are studying. Um, in Russia, there was an event that the Russian authorities call an election, um, but which every time a Western journalist and, um, or a Western newspaper or news website said Putin has won an election, um, they were grossly misleading um, people who were free because there was nothing that he won. There was no contest. There was simply an arrangement that had been um, enforced by the authorities to make people, um, uh, to make some people go to polling stations, stations, and then there was an announcement about what the result was. Um, it, it was not an election in any um, meaningful sense of the word. Um, indeed, the fact that it coincided with the murder of Alexei Navalny, a figure who many Russians regarded as their Mandela, as the person who was going to lead them um, from tyranny when the regime broke down. Um, the fact that, uh, the, the, um, fact that the murder of Russia's most important Democrat coincided with this event um, tells you more um, than um, anything else. Um, I think where Russia is relevant to what we're talking about is the incredibly important role that Russia has played in destabilizing democracy around the world and in promoting autocracy. For a long time, there were Western scholars and IR specialists who were by far the worst, who treated Putin as a rational man who was a patriotic defender of Russia's national interest. Um, He wasn't meant to have any commitment to any particular kind of political system, as long as you weren't harming Russia's interests, as long as you weren't encroaching on its sphere of influence, as long as you weren't expanding Western institutions, then um, Putin wasn't going to be a problem. He was a modernizer, he was a westernizer, he was a civic and and civil nationalist, he was a patriot, and we just need to be nice to him. I think now that argument has become less plausible. the very core of the Putin regime. And um, here its internal practice has spilled out into its external practice, has been dismantling dem- democratic institutions, disrupting first Russia's public sphere and then the public sphere of many um, overseas democracies. Um, it's been about fostering authoritarian institutions, fostering proxies that have um, served as a counterweight to the to, um, uh, to pro-democracy protest at home. Um, today, uh, the, the Putin regime is destabilizing democracy around the world in 
uh, at least three very important ways. First, there's its colossal impact on social media. And in recent years, this has grown. There was a, a short backlash after a Trump's election win and social media companies promised to do something and they started deleting lots of inauthentic user accounts. Um, um, that um, push has failed. Russian influence on social media discussion in the West today is far greater than it's ever been. Um, second, there's an array of support for illiberal forces in the West um, through um, overt financial support, like the um, 2014 loan from a Russian bank to France's National Front. Um, some of this is taking place through um, less obvious means, such as invitations to far right and far left anti-Western publicists and politicians to appear on the Russian propaganda platforms. Russia pays much more than any Western newspaper or um, any Western TV station to appear on this. Um, it's a kind of invisible subsidy for anti-Western forces. And finally, there are a, a massive covert connections between Kremlin-funded neo-Nazi groups and um, Western far-right groups. Um, third, there are clandestine operations by the Russian intelligence services and by hackers hired by the Russian state who are constantly acquiring compromising information about the internal functioning of Western democracies to be strategically used. The US presidential election in 2016, the hacking of the, um, of the um, server of the uh, um, uh, Democratic um, the party was um, a, a classic example of this process, but it's taking place in um, uh, lots of different countries at the same time. Um, one final point. Um, this is all, isn't something that's just random agencies doing what they need to do, um, because spies are always spying on someone. Um, it's something that we know has been coordinated at the very highest levels of the Russian state. Um, we, we know, for instance, from leaked documents that Sergei Kirienko, um, the deputy head of the Russian presidential administration, um, last year held a big meeting of Russian experts, intelligence officials, um, political consultants um, to discuss how to foster cooperation between the German radical left and the German radical right to advance Russia's geopolitical gains. Now, on one level, that had a political goal, which is to use Germany to undermine Western support for Ukraine, but um, it also had a, a clear effect of undermining the political center in Germany, which is the, the um, foundation of the democratic stability in Russia. One final point, um, Russia is promoting autocracy around the world. Um, and what's clear from documents that have come out is that a lot of this is based on the template of Russia's own autocratization. For instance, in Sudan, this is fascinating um, uh, tranche of documents leaked by Wagner, um, which has activists who are militants serving the Kremlin in the 2000s. In, Kremlin youth organizations undermining the pro-democracy opposition, and they are compiling recommendations for the Bashir regime in Sudan about how to transform Sudan's political order to make it more resistant to democratic protest. Um, and this is a problem for anyone concerned about um, democracy in, in the world today, that there is such a powerful state that is promoting autocracy and Subverting democracy in lots of places. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we'll uh, open up for some questions on the floor shortly, including those online. But I, I want to sort of get into the conversation between our panelists first of all. Uh, it would be easy and simple tonight to take the conversation down the road of gloom and doom, a horror movie. Uh, I don't think that's very constructive. It's not to say that, that there's not a very good basis for, for being pessimistic and talking about all things that can go wrong. But um, Tito, I, I think I know where you're coming from, and I think that we're on the same page, that it's not just a kind of 
self-preservation instinct to look on the bright side and be optimistic that in a way there's been a wake-up call to the Indonesian public this year. Um, uh, most voters are, are 30, well, the average age of voters is 30, so, so most don't know the Salato years. And they were suckered into thinking that the man that the popular current president supports must be okay, so we'll vote for him. But I think there'll now be an accounting, there'll be people will start to pay more attention, particularly uh, as Prabowo goes his own way and, and isn't simply a, a continuity uh, president from Jokowi. Um, so civil society is kind of re-energised. And, and civil society is very much being re-energised at the moment in the US. Um, so maybe I'll come to you in a minute, Emma. Um, and I, I think the Congress, India Congress Party is a long way from victory, but but people are paying attention to democracy oh, in yeah. India as well, so it's not hopeless. And, of course, it's, it's it goes without saying that... Um, you know, when, when uh, Navalny's funeral occurred, there were, was an enormous response of very brave people who must have known that every every face was photographed, every person followed. And then at noon on the last day of elections, once again turning up in silent protest, there, there are a lot of people who care and are brave. Now, the, the situation in Russia in the short term is not not great. Uh, but globally, it's not, it's not over for democracy. It's just that democracy is, if we believe it's something that's important, to fight for, and it's of inherent value because of it, it leads to open society and accountability, and uh, and, and and sort of greater equality for everyone. Then it's it's worth fighting for. And at the moment, it's clearer than ever that we do have to fight for it. So, Emma, optimist, pessimist, <laughs> what, what, what makes you optimistic? Let's let's start from that. What, what, what signs of what green shoots can you can you share with us in American democracy? Thank you, Greg. That's a good question because that is really. Um... It's very difficult not to catastrophize mm. at the moment. Um, and I think, I mean, I think it's evidence-based catastrophizing, mm. but it, it is an excellent point that you make. And I think, you know, where I find um, hope when it comes to the United States, where the situation is nonetheless pretty grim, is in both the 2020 and 2022 midterm election results. So... 2020 as well, you know, was framed quite rightly, I think, as a, a, you know, Biden framed it as a battle for the soul of America. And in 2022 as well, there was much similar framing around, you know, we have to prevent this kind of red wave of Republicans taking over Congress because of the threat that they pose to democracy. And American voters were receptive to that message. They, they clearly heard it and turned out, particularly in the 2022 midterms, to ensure that there wasn't a, a total takeover of, of Congress by Republicans. And a huge, you know, if not the defining factor in that was women, right? So, and, and Biden said that and acknowledged it very deliberately in his State of the Union address earlier this month, where he, he kind of said, you know, underestimate the electoral and political power of women at your peril. And I think he's right. I think that was a huge mobilising factor in 2022. And, of course, the situation has only gotten worse for women since then. So if you look at some states like Alabama has been in the news recently where there are horrific stories of women, you know, basically being told, too bad, you're going to die because we can't provide you the health care that you need. And there are enough, tragically, there are enough, I think, people in many of those states who know somebody or know of somebody who has been in that kind of situation. And that is hugely mobilising, I think, um, in terms of getting people out to vote. And Republicans are kind of like uh, will acknowledge that. You, you can hear talk of that in, you know, this idea that Trump needs to pick a woman um, for his vice president because he's got a woman problem. And so there's a sort of slight acknowledgement of that, the problem being that the women the women that are, uh, you know, um, being presented as the options for vice president are kind of all in, you know, MAGA. Um, there's a whole, actually an excellent article in the New York Times today about how um, Christy Noam has just gotten new teeth um, so that she'll be a more appealing vice presidential candidate to Trump. Like that's, that's what we're dealing with here. But... I think the the electorate and particularly women in the electorate are mobilising around that issue in particular because as much as Republicans are kind of acknowledging that they've got a bit of a woman problem, most of the time they are pretty openly doubling down on crushing reproductive rights. So if you... Um, 
look at something called Project 2025, which is the Heritage Foundation. So the Heritage Foundation is a conservative think tank that kind of came to prominence just before Reagan was elected and handed Reagan what they called a mandate for leadership. So it's like a manifesto for a conservative president, which Reagan then went on to basically implement in full. They've done it again. So they've written a, I think it's 900 pages of um, really granular detail um, kind of outlining an agenda for the next conservative president. And in, in the, I'm pretty sure it's in the introduction, I'd have to double check, but in the introduction to that, it says the overturning of Roe v. Wade was just the start. You know, and they're going after IVF, they're going after contraception as well. And so I, I keep doing this, making things sound really grim, but I, the flip side of that is th that that is mobilising, that is really mobilising to voters. And, of course, in the United States, that mobilisation is key. Biden's ability to turn out voters, which has rightly been questioned at the moment, is going to be critical for him. And if he can turn out women and, and use that electoral and political power, then I think there's hope for American democracy. Well, if, if Biden gets that turnout, um, I don't think he'll be making a public thanks, but in, in some ways credit will go to Donald Trump mm. because he's, I mean, of all the inept things he does, one thing he's achieving so far is mobilising people for a yeah, good cause. Totally. Um, well, that, I mean, that was his kind of one, like his singular achievement of his whole administration was to hand conservatives the Supreme Court, which gave them the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And he can't, he, you can see he's not able to not talk about how proud he is of that. And the uh, I'm looking for green shoots. Um, the other big achievement of Donald Trump lately is his uh, election funds. I mean, he's, he's, a, yeah, he's, he's, financial, he's a rolling financial disaster for his own party. He's Can't find the money. Yeah. Just gutted the uh, you know, Republican uh, machine, put his own deal in place, which is horrible, but that actually may give some hope that yeah. uh, the Biden campaign may get its act together and people may turn out and vote. Uh, Tito, where does your optimism come from? Um, I mean, I'm a social media researcher, so... Um, there's evidence, there's evidence. <laughs> there's evidence, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, but also we can't make huge conclusions okay. from just looking at what's trending on Twitter. But during the day... <laughs> really? really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's interesting because in Indonesia... It was looking so good. <laughs> well, uh, in Indonesia, Twitter is still the progressive choice. Yes, um, yes. TikTok is kind of... Prabowo was winning the TikTok war, basically. Um, but on Twitter... Ganjar and Anis. Anis was very popular on Twitter. But also on Twitter during the day of the election. Um, you know, and, you know, obviously in Indonesia during that day, you know, Prabowo was trending, Anis was trending, Ganjar was trending. But there's this one tweet that was also gaining likes. I think that day, again, about 18,000 likes. It was from Ibu Maria Marsi, mm -hmm. who is from 2007. She's been standing in front of the presidential palace every Thursday to ask for, to talk to the president about his son, oh, sorry, her son who was killed in the 98th riot. She's been like, doing like this. Like the group. The, the, uh, the yeah, exactly. operation, yes. Yeah. So, and so she started a whole movement called Kamisan. Every Thursday, she's been doing this for 17 years every Thursday. If you go to Jakarta on Thursday, I think at around 3 um, p.m., you go there and there'll be about 200 people all wearing black, all um, carrying black umbrellas, you know, which is a very symbolic but like peaceful movement. So she's been doing this for, to, uh, for 17 years. And that tweet basically is her saying, hey, come to the Kamisan next week. She's just doing what she's been doing for a long time. And, and I think that that tweet, I think, for me, just said something. It changed my feeling that day because that my feeling that day was, oh, the Prabhu is winning. I was catastrophizing everything. But then seeing this amazing woman leading the small movements, it's like, oh, no, hold on. We have this. And Ibu Maris Marci also works with Suchiwati, the wife of the slain um, human rights lawyer, Munir. And she's doing some amazing things as well. Um, and yeah, and then my WhatsApp groups as well, you know, people are, you know, talking about, okay, what do we need to do um, to make sure that we can talk to people? And I think, and I think what you said before, Greg, about, um, you know, I think one of the challenges in Indonesia right now is that we don't have a leader who can actually talk and convey their ideas to, to a lot of uh, voters. 
um, in an effective way because I think Jokowi is probably the only person who can do that right now and because he's been doing this for the, you know, in the last you know, 10 years or so. Um, but I think Anis and Gander, we it's very difficult for them to speak to people, to tell, to you know, to talk about ideas. Um, and, and yeah, I think, but if you look at, um, there is this um, movement by young Indonesians that started this website called Bijak Mamilih. Mm-hmm. Bijak Mamilih means uh, to be wise in your choice, basically. And, and it was just an amazing website where you can look at the different uh, candidates and the different political parties. And they were doing this independently of, you know, uh, they, they got funding from different organizations. And so I think I'm largely optimistic because of this. I'm largely optimistic because here yeah, we're seeing people, you know, uh, women like Ibu Marisa Marsi, Sutiwati, we're seeing young people um, from different p- parts of politics, you know, doing some really amazing things. Uh, but also at the same time, we know that Prabhu got a lot of votes from those young people as well, who, yeah, they probably don't really, you know, he was, I mean, if you study the way he was campaigning, it's a big success from someone who was known as temperamental, angry, you know, former military, to someone who was basically called the cute grandpa. You know, so they were very successful in getting the young voters, but also that says something about the young voters, which is, yeah, they cannot, I think, yeah, they don't know what Prabhu did, basically, mm-hmm. to put it bluntly. So, ironically, I mean, what, one of the hopes for Indonesia is that the voter turnout was high, so people are invested in democracy, they yeah. care about it, but kind of the subtext of what you're saying, Tito, is they need to have their hearts broken first before they wake up to what, what's going on, but yeah. that is perhaps in the process of happening. Pradeep, uh, um, there's a lot of um, energy in, in, in India's democracy. Of course, we well, have to give credit to Modi that, um, like it or not, he's worked very hard to put a machine together. So that that is, you know, that politics is politics. You work hard. That makes a difference. But the other side is slowly getting their game together, not fast enough. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they, they formed a coalition uh, is a good sign because the democracy needs a strong opposition too. I mean, there's no doubt that the BJP has outdone its political opponents you know, in terms of building an organization, raising money, creating a discipline sort of uh, you know, cadre base. Uh, they have, um, in terms of representation, you can't fault India's democracy because elections are held, um, you know, uh, every five years for for the assembly for for the parliament and then for every state assembly, uh, these elections are largely peaceful. I mean, there are you know incidents of violence here and there. So my my concern is not sort of about the representation part of democracy. I think that is going well. It is popular. Indians like to go out and vote at the elections. As I said at the beginning earlier, election commission does a great job. I think they deserve a prize for for conducting this massive exercise in holding elections. But it's what, I mean, it's the democratic temperament which is a bigger concern. So, for example, unlike any other democracy I know of, uh, the Prime Minister of India over the last 10 years doesn't give press conferences, there are no doorstops, and increasingly, when leaders, representatives, spokespeople of the party talk about the prime minister on television, for example, and most of the TV channels are dominated by, uh, you know, by the BJP, and support for BJP is very strong. In, and Indian in television is quite something, right? Yeah, just, just to explain, if people have been watching Indian television lately, it's um, it's colourful. It's very colourful. It's yeah. very colourful. It's very loud. It's very noisy. Uh, but um, and then you do see people from different parties represented, even on te- television channels which are very well known to be pro BJP, and most of them are, most of the anchors are. But uh, they do invite people from other parties, except they don't let them really speak <laughs> because you know, they, they often get shouted down by the anchor. But coming back to the you know the question of the democratic temperament, so for example. 
whenever BJP spokespeople, other members of the BJP ministers, when they refer to the prime minister on television or in public anywhere, they always have to say the honorable prime minister. Right? And, and I don't think it is anything cultural, although I'm told when I actually raised this issue, I was told that this is a cultural thing in India. You know, we respect people in power. But that's not always been the case. I mean, I don't remember, you know, other former prime ministers being, being you know, talked off the same way as Prime Minister Modi does. He doesn't address any press conferences. He doesn't give any interviews. There are, there are a few exceptions. I think they were going to Paris Zakaria. Uh, there, was an in, there was an interview that Prime Minister Modi gave to a Bollywood actor uh, who, as it turned out, after the interview, was not even an Indian citizen. He was a Canadian citizen. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, it was a friendly interview with questions like, Prime Minister, how do you work so hard? You know, where do you get the energy <laughs> to work so hard? So uh, apart from those interviews, Prime Minister Modi doesn't give it. So when it comes to the actual accountability, scrutiny, uh, and not just in parliament, but you know, outside parliament, I mean, after all, media plays a very important part in democracy. And, and media in India, there's 800 plus television channels in India, and, and there's hundreds of news channels in various languages. And when you turn them on, you see, it becomes very quickly, very clear, that um, that the anchors who are hosting these debates, which is supposed to be very objective, uh, they they have a very one-sided view of uh, politics in India. So that is more concerning. But my optimism comes from the fact that there is still a great deal of enthusiasm in India for democracy, for elections. And, and there's no doubt, I mean, when you look at the economy, India is one of the fastest growing major economies in the world, uh, and and that would obviously work in favor of the government. You know, uh, when it comes to um, uh, appealing, you know, in elections, you have to win votes. You have to you have to try and persuade people to vote for you. And Prime Minister Modi has done a great job. I mean, from his point of view, from the point of view of BJP, of appealing to the Hindu majority by very openly. Uh, attending religious ceremonies, inaugurating temples. Uh, I mean, in some ways, I was thinking when I was watching Prime Minister Modi inaugurate recently the Ayodhya mm. temple, uh, I was thinking of any leader of a religious state, because India is still constitutionally a secular country. I, I could not think of any leader, including the president of Iran, who so overtly expresses religiosity, as Prime Minister Modi does. So that, and, 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 and there is support for it. In fact, you know, after uh, Prime Minister Modi's, you know, inauguration of the Ayodhya Temple, the Ram Temple, uh, it seems there has been a boost to BJP support, you know, in polling. So it works for them. But opposition parties have not been successful in creating crafting a counter-narrative. There were attempts early on by the Congress party, for example, Rahul Gandhi. When Rahul Gandhi was uh, elected the leader of his party, he's no longer officially the leader because there is a, a new, there's another president of the Congress party. But when he was elected as a president, they tried to engage in kind of soft Hindutva, you know, trying to take a leaf out of BJP's book and they conducted religious prayers, which is very unusual for Congress party. Uh, and, and they were criticized. They were quite rightly criticized by, by commentators in India for trying to practice this soft Hindutva. Uh, but I don't think the opposition, uh, and particularly Congress, because Congress really is the only national opposition party. All of the parties are regional parties. And I don't think the Congress has been able to create a counter-narrative. Uh, BJP's narrative is popular. It's been bought by the people. And in a democracy, you know, that's important. But the opposition's job is to create a counter-narrative. And I don't think BJP has succeeded in, in creating a counter-narrative. I think I mean, talking about narratives, I think one of the cross-cutting things we're talking about tonight is um, authoritarian populism and toxic nationalism, which is certainly there in abundance in, in Putin's Russia. 
Um, and perhaps, Robert, you can unpack for us a little bit of how it's got to this point, because it wasn't always this way. It sort of reached a, a, a peak of um, you know, bringing in um, Orthodox Christianity, Russian nationalism in a very overt way that in the past Putin let other people do. Uh, now he's embodied this um, you know, voice of the people role uh, more, um, <coughs> you know, without any pretense. Uh, so could you explain that to us? And also, I'd like to imagine a day in, in future when you write a book about how the Putin regime ended mm -hmm. and perhaps speculate <laughs> what will be in that book. I mean, how, how, I mean, maybe it's beginning to end now, but I don't suppose the end is close at hand, but it, it will end because it, it, it doesn't, nothing lasts forever. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, perhaps if I address that um, at last issue first, um, I, I have to confess I am an optimist. I'm sort of the glass is 1% full kind of guy. <laughs> um, I, I do see reasons for optimism about the future of Russia. One of the reasons is that Putin has destroyed a lot of the institutions of the Russian state. He's created a very personal regime where institutions don't function, where power is exercised through private meetings, through authorizations um, for people to spend resources to achieve a particular goal. A lot of this is done through proxies rather than state officials. Um, Inside the system, it is chaotic and highly dysfunctional. Um, that hollowing out of institutions is one of the things that makes it possible for um, the Putin regime to, la to um, launch a, a catastrophically prepared war, and for that war, at least for the first year, to go very badly. Another reason I'm optimistic, I'm optimistic is the lack of evidence support for the regime. I mean, the, the polls all show high levels of support for Putin, but there's almost no social trust in Russia. If you're living in a, a factory town in the Urals and you get a phone call saying, do you support the president? If you're, con if you're concerned about the future of your family, you will say, of course I support the president, and of course I support the war. Um, another issue is the, the extent to which Putin's reputation was destroyed by Navalny. Um, Navalny's expose of Putin's personal corruption um, is building a, a palace for Putin. Um, I think I think it's been viewed about 130 million times. It's by far the most popular Russian language documentary or um, video on YouTube. A very significant percentage of that, almost certainly over two thirds, is by people in Russia because most people in the West aren't going to sit through a two hour documentary about the president of another country. Um, the other weakness of the regime is the tension between its ideology and its and the reality that Navalny and um, his foundation against corruption have demonstrated. The propaganda is about patriotic Christian values and defending Christianity against the decadent West and about being warriors and frugal. The reality is Putin's weird palace with its Louis the Fourteenth, golden pillars and eagles, and um, rooms set up with pokey machines and pole dancing. Um, that tension, particularly for vast numbers of the Russian population who are struggling to make ends meet, um, between Putin's propaganda and what they know about the nature of his rule, um, is a major weakness and. We saw some of the effects of this during the Prigozhin uprising. What was striking about that was not merely the fact that it showed just how this functional Russian state had become. There was no politics anymore. The only politics was armed conflict between security between security structures. But it also showed no one came out to support the regime. Prigozhin was a pretty nasty guy. I mean, he's um, criminal, killed lots of people. Um, he's uh, definitely a um, the war criminal on several continents. And no one was concerned that he might be on the verge of taking over. No one demonstrated for the regime. The only way that the regime gets people to, to appear at its events is by forcing state employees to go to a particular place and get their names to tell. Finally, I, I see hope for the democratic opposition in Russia. Um, the exiles are incredibly effective, partly because Putin is afraid to stop YouTube for some reason. And um, Dorsch Television, the um, 
uh, uh, which used to be Russia's most important cable news station. Um, it broadcasts very effectively. Um, so the uh, Navalny's group that have uh, um, several uh, YouTube channels and just lots of people watch them um, in the um, hundreds of thousands regularly. Um, also, it's important that the opposition's had a really serious debate, a, a, a debate mainly between political prisoners, which is just amazing itself. Lawyers were allowed to meet the political prisoners and they were discussing what went wrong with Russia's last experiment with democracy and what needs to change. And they kind of reached a consensus that you need some kind of lustration. So someone like Putin from the security structures doesn't come back to power. You need constitutional change. So you don't have a super presidential system where a, a president can concentrate patronage and power. Um, and you need um, to deal very seriously with the problem of corruption, something that the first wave of the Democrats, they saw corruption as a political instrument rather than, uh, a, uh, uh, rather than something that's going to erode support for democracy. Regarding nationalism, yeah, this is really dangerous. Um, Putin uses nationalism to mobilize liberal forces around the world. He mobilized nationalism at home as a counterweight to democratic protests. Um, and it really started to get bad in the late 2000s when Navalny was trying to build an alliance of Democrats and radical nationalists. And at that point, and I've um, written a book about this, the Putin regime started funding hardcore neo-Nazis, people who believed in an apartheid state where non-whites wouldn't have the right to travel out of their homelands. Um, and um, the Putin regimes started supporting those people because they were a powerful weapon against pro-democracy protest. Um, if you're an authoritarian regime, if you're a kleptocrat and you want to find someone to fight against Democrats, then Nazis are great because they hate democracy. They are prepared to do anything um, to uh, join um, an authoritarian state. They get access to the resources of the state. Um, and they can attack their ideological enemies. And where the Putin regime is today, waging a genocidal war in Ukraine, is very much the result of those internal developments um, around 2008-2009. And just on, on that um, point about that uh, exchange between prisoners and prisons and, the, and that power of civil society, what was it that, that uh, Lovani said if he was killed that it would mean that... Um, I mean, it, it's a terrible tragedy that he was killed, but in a, in a way, prophetically, he said, you know, this could happen and it would be a sign of of our strength, right? That if they have to kill me, it means we're we're strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he also and said, don't give in, which has mm. become um, something that um, lots of Russians opposed to the regime are just constantly saying as their slogans. Mm. That phrase is going to go down in sort of Russian history as um, the motto of any regime that emerges from the wreckage of Putin. Yeah, so for all the corruption, all the power, the brutality of Putin's regime, it's still vulnerable to a people awakened to a sense of righteous anger. Yeah, I, I think that also... Um, Putin has demonstrated that dictatorship is a path to disaster. Mm. In that sense, you know, um, just as democracy in Germany probably owes more to Adolf Hitler than to a tradition of um, liberal democratic activism, future democracy in Russia will almost certainly be tremendously indebted to the catastrophe that Putin led his country into. Yeah, yeah, there's so much to unpack here. I wish we had more time. But uh, before we do run out of time, I'll, I'll throw to the floor for questions and including online, uh, Kira, I don't know whether the questions come in. But um, any observations, questions? Yes. I'll pass the microphone since we're recording. Uh, thank you. Um, I have um, one question about war. Um, so, what does this mean for Australia? Um, um, the reason I'm asking this is, well, uh, number one, well, since the Russia event result came out, uh, UK, US, and EU, they have all declared that the event is illegitimate. And Australia so far has not said anything like that. And uh, another 
instant triggered me asking this question is what Emma mentioned. Since what happened about this conversation, and it seems to me that the Australian media is talking about how to ensure if there is another Trump presidency to make sure to best protect Australia's national interest is to have the right ambassador who has a minimum a workable relationship with the new administration, or even better, someone can play golf with Trump. Mm -hmm. Again, what should Australia do to best advocate for the global democracy order? Over to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, um, I. I certainly think it would be a wonderful thing if Australia's foreign minister said that we don't recognise Vladimir Putin as the legitimate president of Russia. Um, nevertheless, I, I think the Australian government has done pretty well, given the fact that Russia isn't a country in our immediate neighbourhood. Um, for <laughs> European democracies, and the uh, Russian threat looms much larger. Um, our... Ambassador I, um, in Moscow, I think, reacted quite well to the death of Navalny. He um, publicly laid flowers at um, a, a site that um, a Russian human rights activists always honoured the victims of political terror in Russia. Um, but uh, certainly I would like to see more efforts by the Australian government to support civil society. Um, in Russia, um, organizations like the, the Foundation Against Corruption and the Russian Television have a real impact on what Russians think. And the more resources they get, the more they can do. Um, any Australian government concerned with promoting democracy should be supporting those people. And Robert, as you alluded, and there's a lot of incredibly brave people in Russia today, but also a lot of people have gone into exile, which is sad, but it also means they're in a position to do more perhaps than if they'd been stayed at home. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and um, here, uh, um, it is particularly those two um, platforms, um, the Dorsch. Driven out of Russia, uh, yeah. Television mm. and um, Navalny's people. But um, it's also worth remembering that they live in great risk too. Mm. Um, Navalny's chief of staff um, visited Melbourne last year. I had a, a, a series of really interesting conversations with him. Um, last week, he was attacked outside his house in Vilnius, Lithuania, mm -hmm. um, by someone wielding a hammer. His arm was broken, his legs were injured. Um, uh, this is a regime that has no qualms about um, terrorising its adversaries, both at home and abroad. And they were no doubt terrorising. They could have quietly poisoned him or shot him at range, perhaps. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's not safe anywhere if you're standing up to Putin. Mm -hmm. Well, Emma, cheerier note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Look, I think you're right. The whole framing has been, um, you know, how do we make sure that if Trump is re-elected, he lets us keep those submarines? Um, and the whole, the whole, any planning that seems to be happening, that they're not, <laughs> we don't need them and we're not going to get them. Um, the, but the whole... Uh, the extent of planning that seems to be happening, at least from from viewed from the outside, for a Trump administration, it was a scramble to get AUKUS legislated in the United States before election season. So you have the spectacle then of our Prime Minister sitting down and chatting politely for the cameras with Mike Johnson, who's the Speaker of the House in the United States and one of the key architects of January 6 and Trump's efforts to overturn the election. Right. So this is what this is kind of what we are reduced to. Which is extraordinary because Trump hasn't won the election. He hasn't been re-elected. He may not be. Um, and it's good and right that the Australian ambassador should be standing up for the values of democracy and saying, no, actually, this guy is an active threat. You know, we, we don't want to have a good relationship with this guy. That would say terrible things about us and also be really bad for our security. It's really terrible risk management for Australia. So I think we really um, continually also kind of underestimate our agency in, in this relationship as well, that we actually have 
incredible leverage with the Americans. There are many situations in which they need us more than we need them, right? And we, uh, I think the Australian government should be going to Biden and saying it's in our interests that your democracy survives, so how do we work together to, to help to start to make sure that that happens? And that I think is, you know, through building kind of genuine diplomatic and ex, ex, well, relationship, reciprocal relationships with Congress, for example, rather than focusing sh- solely on security and getting obsessed with submarines. And that, But that kind of means really, I think, a pretty radical reshaping of Australian foreign policy and how it is done because part of the reason we get AUKUS in the first place is because Australian foreign and security policy is such a closed shop. You know, it is it is actively anti-democratic and the American side of that relationship supports that too. So I think it's forcing foreign policy into much more democratic accountability and transparency. But, you know, again, to be try and be more um, optimistic, Australia has a lot to offer the United States in that um, in that regard. You know, of course, our democracy is, is far from perfect, but we have a lot of really robust institutions, the most obvious one being an independent federal election commission that, you know, the United States could actually kind of use. <laughs> and maybe we should be talking about that with a bit more pride um, and, and be a bit louder about that. That's my hope. Anyway. There's a, thank you very much. And there's a couple of questions over here. So uh, we'll do, perhaps we'll take both to, uh, one after the other and then get over to the panel. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Tushar from um, PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne. Uh, my question is to Mr. Andrew. Um, Tito, you mentioned that uh, there's a hope in social media and there's hope that uh, decent is still there and getting um, you know support from masses. Uh, but smart politicians and political parties have been able to figure out that uh, this decent can turn against them. So they have been also utilizing, for example, in India, uh, Prime Minister Modi recently uh, launched an award called Influencer uh, of the Year Award, where he co- he invited actually 20,000 uh, influencers from India and gave awards to at least uh, around, around 200 influencers. And believe me or not, these influencers are going to support the narrative that BJP is trying to put forward. Because, uh, I mean, it's a human nature, they, they are getting awarded, they are people who most of them were doing nothing because this employment rate has come down and they are doing something on YouTube or Instagram. TikTok is banned in India, unfortunately. Uh, So these people are going to support these regimes. So is there really a hope and, or or can we say that the hope in social media can be only seen in countries which allow that? Or is there a balance that can be maintained? Or what is uh, more interestingly, what can be the role of people who own these social media platforms? Okay, and we'll quickly pick it up. Thank you, that's great. And pick that the last question here and then move fairly quickly because we will yeah, get out of time. Um, uh, yeah. Aldous Oslins from Western Sydney University. Um, the war in Ukraine may have shown problems in other democracies. Um, Indonesia played the um, typical ASEAN neutrality stance and hoped that Putin would come to the G20. Um, Modi has um, continued to see Russia as an ally and a supplier, and uh, whether he's helping break sanctions is an open question. And uh, in America, um, support for Ukraine has stalled Um, because of internal wranglings in the lower house of Congress. Um, Are these problems of democracy or other sorts of problems? Perhaps we'll start with you, Tito, then I'll ask Robert and Pradeep and Emma to start. I mean, yeah, social media, it's, I mean, you know, I can talk for hours about this, but very quick. (laughs) Um, I think you're right. I think, you know, you mentioned YouTube as well. YouTube has been amazing. So um, a lot of activists have been using YouTube, but I think, and including Dandi Laksono, a filmmaker who published uh, an amazing fi- film called Dirty Vote just the day before the election, and that was watched by millions and millions of people, um, did really ch- change the results of the election, but th- that film is going to be there, it's going to be on YouTube, um, and it will remain a resource for people to understand what's going on. Um, but on the other hand, in Indonesia, the, you know, India has influence or award, in Indonesia, we have these people called buzzers, and they are not known. 
So this is their weapon that they are not known, but they have access to hundreds of accounts and you pay them money and they can basically, yeah, you, you want um, the conversations to change on Twitter, you can do that. But again, their main weapon is to not be known. Um, which is a really interesting kind of thing to look at. If you want to read more about this, there is an Inside Indonesia um, edition on election, I'm sorry, on buzzer. So if you just look up political buzzer Indonesia, you can see some really yeah interesting. And I think my short answer is we still don't understand this world, um, but you, we can see some really, really, I can see some potential for people to you know reach, reach out to each other to talk about democracy. Uh, but on the other hand, yeah, we know that it's used by, including yeah, by the Russian uh, players as well, to to change you know election results around the world. So yeah. Thanks. Um, I certainly think the waning international support for Ukraine is uh, profoundly disturbing. Um, the fact that it's um, uh, partly coming from the uh, developing world where um, Putin has been assiduously cultivating support is disturbing given the Putin regime is effectively waging an, an explicitly the colonial war. Um, this is something that has roots in the history of Russian imperialism. Um, that's the language that Russian propagandists are speaking in. Um, the other side of it that is immensely disturbing is waning support in Western democracies, and um, part of that certainly testifies to the effectiveness of the Putin regime's propaganda apparatus, its ability to disseminate disinformation about Ukraine, and, and the fact that that is now being taken up by people like Elon Musk and various far-right propagandists who are, are being favoured by um, the a social media platform that he's transformed. Sorry, just I, I remember there's there's that question about, about what social media uh, company owners should do. Just don't do anything. Just basically, you know, like I think Google has good uh, policies with YouTube, just letting people do what they're doing. Elon is an example. Of, yeah, okay. when he, don't don't be Elon. Yeah. Don't be Elon is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, I think your question in reference to India and uh, Modi's position on Russia. Um, as I see it, I think if you look at Indian foreign policy and India's relations with Russia, obviously, part of that, really there is not a significant change uh, from the previous, the UPA government. And I can't imagine a prime minister from another party in India, whether it's Congress or any other party, would have sort of adopted a different approach to the Ukraine issue uh, than what Prime Minister Modi has done. I think that is not so much about Modi, that is more about India's own sort of definition of its own interests. So, for example, when on the 24th of February 2020, when Putin started this war in Ukraine, and I was very curious to see how India was going to react to this, but it was also predictable, because I didn't think India was going to condemn it. There was no way India was going to condemn it. Modi or no Modi, I don't think India would have condemned it, largely because of uh, a number of factors. In the media, often India's dependence on Russia for weapons, for military hardware has been mentioned, which is changing. It is true that India still has a lot of legacy equipment, you know, military hardware, which is of Russian origin, which requires spare parts and everything which had to come from Russia. But I think apart from that, there are other geopolitical factors. For example, India, we've seen how the China-Russia relationship has changed. I mean, Soviet Union used to be the big brother, but now clearly Putin represents the younger brother. Every time Xi Jinping holds a party, Putin turns up, right? <laughs> so that relationship is completely transformed. Russia has also opened security relations with Pakistan. India, does not want to push Russia even closer to China and to Pakistan. Because that equation, if there were to be an alliance of sorts among China, Russia, and Pakistan, that would create a security nightmare for India. 
So India's interest is in maintaining a good level of relations with Russia and to make sure that this China-Russia relationship doesn't go beyond a certain point, that it doesn't become detrimental to India's interests. So I don't think even a Congress prime minister would have adopted a different approach. And the latest update, of course, is that Prime Minister Modi called Putin and congratulated him yesterday. But he also called President Zelensky. He also called President Zelensky of Ukraine and said that, look, we would work towards an end to this conflict. You know, let's work towards an end to this conflict, which is something which he said before, you know, when he met Putin, um, where was it? In uh, Somewhere in Central Asia. Uh, he said this is not an era of war. And that, of course, has been made much of in the Indian media and by Indian government. But it was a very simple statement that this is not an era of war. But from India's point of view, that actually was a major statement. And that India was telling Putin that this kind of aggression, violation of sovereignty. And India, India of course, has, has always been critical of uh, invasions where there's a clear violation of sovereignty of another, another state. So India finds itself in a difficult position. It is not just the dependence on Russian uh, weapons and weapon systems. It is also about the geopolitics of the area. That, I think, is lost in much of the Western media coverage of India's position. Yeah, it's a fair point. I think even without um, Prime Minister Modi, for all we may criticise him, any other Indian Prime Minister would probably be in the same position. Yeah. Emma, last quick question. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll be quick because I know we're over time. Um, I think it is a significant problem for American democracy and it's why I think Robert's point about uh, the international networks of neo-Nazis is, is such an important thing to highlight, particularly in the United States. But, but the reason I think that that kind of um, nefarious action by the Putin regime has been so effective in the United States is because the conditions were there for it to work. Like, don't underestimate the kind of power of old-fashioned, homegrown American fascism, right? And I think if you want to understand the transformation of the Republican Party under Trump, you, you need only look to Russia and Ukraine and the fleet that's happened there, which is not about kind of politicking in Congress. It's because those far-right Republicans in the United States see Putin as an ideological ally. They see what he's done in Russia as, as establishing effectively a kind of white ethno state which oppresses minorities, which is heteronormative, and they like what they see and they want to implement that. Exactly, yeah, and that's what they want to implement at home. So I think that's such an important point to highlight because it's not it's not just strategic, it's not just them disrupting, it's a, a, a kind of core problem with American democracy that too often doesn't get, it, that too often is understood, I think. Thank you, panelists. This is fantastic. I wish we had more time. I'm sorry that we kept you waiting to start. Um, maybe we can find a way to come back later on this year and, and carry on the conversation because this is the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> it's, it's a great beginning. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.